Hi there, I'm Alejandra, engineer on the Android Developer Relations team. Hi everyone, I'm Manuel, same team, same title. Welcome to Advanced State and Side Effects in Jep Compose workshop. In this code lab, you will learn all about complex state management in Compose and Side Effect APIs. Yeah, in particular, you will learn how to produce state and observe streams of data in Compose to update the UI, how to create a state holder for stateful composables, side effect APIs such as launch defect, remember updated state, reduce state and derive state of, and also how to create coroutines and call suspend functions in composables using the remember coroutine scope API. Quite exciting, isn't it? So you might remember us from another code along in which we built a wellness app. If you haven't solved the state in Jetpack Compose code lab and are unfamiliar with basic handling state in Compose with APIs like mutable state and remember, make sure you check that one first. You can find the link in the video description below. Today, we will work on an unfinished application, Crane, a material study app which consists of a trouble share chat that helps you find flights, hotels, and restaurants given different parameters like amount of people, location, and dates. We'll go step by step through the code lab, adding features and refactoring the code to improve it. For example, populating a list of suggested destinations and adding a splash screen to the app. So I'm going to be sharing my screen with the code lab text, Android Studio, and the emulator so you can easily follow along as we solve it. As always with code labs, we advise that you try to solve it as you watch, or maybe later, but do try to solve it yourself so all the concepts really stick. Also, I already completed step number two of the code lab, which is setting up the environment and downloading the app start code in the main branch. OK, now that we know what we need, what we are building, and we have the code ready, let's take a look at the UI state production pipeline section. So the first feature that we want to implement in Crane, our travel sample app, is populating the list of suggested destinations. So it looked like our design. If we run the app from a main branch right now, we see that this list is empty. And to fix this, we have to complete essentially two steps. Add the logic to the view model to produce the UI state, which is the list of suggested destinations, and consume the state from the UI to show the list. Let's see how to do it. For any kind of app, we recommend implementing a layered architecture to obey common good architectural principles like separation of concerns, single source of truth, and testability. That's the architecture you can see in this app. To populate the UI with data coming from other layers of the hierarchy, we use a UI state production pipeline. This is a process in which we typically access the data layer from the view model or any other state holder, apply business rules if needed, and then expose the screen UI state in an observable data holder class. The UI consumes that UI state and displays the information on the screen. If you're interested in learning more about UI state production, check the link in the video description. So the data layer in this application is already implemented. What we have to do now is use that data layer to produce state. So we can open the main view model and we can define a suggested destination variable of type mutable state flow to represent the list of suggested destinations and set an empty list as the initial value. And this is a variable, it's private and will only be mutated in this view model. And next up, we can define an, an immutable variable, suggested destination just below, of type state flow. This is the public read-only variable that can be consumed from the UI. And also, I'm using an extension as state flow that will transform the mutable state flow with defined v4 from mutable to immutable. Yeah, this is a general good practice. You ensure the screen UI state cannot be modified unless it goes through the view model. Thus, we can say that the view model is the single source of truth for the screen UI state. So in the view models init block now, what we can do is just access a data layer calling the repository dot destinations and assign it to our private variable suggested destinations we defined before. And finally, we can uncomment all the usages of suggested destination in this class, for example, here, here, and here. And this will make our variable to be properly updated with events that are coming from the UI. The screen has selectors, for example, um, the adult selector and destination selector. And our suggested destination will be updated when you change the amount of people in this function or when you change, for example, the destination in this other method. 
yeah, this is great. The first step is done. Now, the B model is able to produce a UI state. Next up, we need to consume the UI state from the UI. So our list is still empty, so let's open Crane Home and look at Crane Home content. So Crane Home Content Composable contains the backdrop scaffold. And this component allows you to define a back layer content or um, the, con the, the part of the screen where the selectors are, like the select number of adults and destination. And then you have a front layer content, which is where our list of suggested destinations will be. So we want the UI to update and show the list of suggested destinations here whenever there is a new item emitted into the stream of data. And to help us do that, we can use the collector state with Lifecycle API. To start using the collector state with Lifecycle API, first add the Lifecycle runtime compose dependency to your app's build.gradle file. The variable Lifecycle underscore version is defined already in the project with the right version, at least 2.6. Now we can sync the project. Great. So now we can go back to Crane Home Content. We can assign suggested destinations to a call to view model dot suggested destination, and then we use, uh, which is our flow, and then we use collect a state with lifecycle to collect from that flow. Um, and then we can run the app in the meantime. These APIs will, this API will collect the values from the state flow and map the latest values to compose state in a lifecycle aware manner. And this allows your app to save app resources when not needed, such as when the app is in the background. Now the compose code reading this state value recompose on new emissions. So you run the app now, we see that the list of destinations is actually populated. Also, this list updates thanks to the logic present in the view model. For example, when you change the amount of adults, it changes, and when you change the to destination, for example, Argentina. Compose also offers APIs to transform other stream-based solutions like RxDeva2, RxDeva3, and Live Data into Compose state. Check the Compose and other libraries documentation to learn more about that. Okay, so we just learned how to produce UI state from the state holder using Stateflow and how to consume it in the UI. Let's move on to the next step in the code lab. So, and next up in this step, uh, of our project, we want to add a landing screen to the app, which could be used to load all the data needed in the background. In a real app starting Android 12, you should use the Android Splash API instead of implementing a custom a splash. So keep it in mind that this is just an example to illustrate the next API. So for a splash screen, we want to show the full screen with the logo. Then there will be a delay as a simulation of data being loaded in the background. And then we navigate to the main home screen. There is already a file called landing screen, that, which we are going to open now, uh, which is where we can put the code that we need to implement. And somewhere in our landing screen, we're going to make a call to our backend to load data. And we can represent this, if we remove this, with a call to delay and splash wait time. The problem is that we cannot just run a suspend function here just like that. We have two problems. The first one is obvious. This does not compile. As it says, suspend function delay should be called only from a coroutine or another suspend function. So we need another API to help us here. But also, we shouldn't just call this method like, like this in this composable function, because remember, composable functions can run multiple times. This can make our backend call run multiple times too, which can be expensive. And also, composables can be restarted in the middle of the call without you knowing. So for more, uh, for more on how Compose works, you can check the Thinking in Compose docs linked below. Calling the network to fetch data asynchronously is a side effect. And we need a way to run side effects in a safe and controlled way in Compose. In general, a side effect is a change to the state of the app. When talking about side effects in Compose, we are referring to invoking side effects from a composable and altering the state of the app outside the scope of that composable function. For example, opening a new screen when the user taps on a button, showing a message when the app doesn't have internet connection, sending analytics events, or calling the network, like it's the case for this section of the code lab. OK, so back to our code. How do we safely run the suspend function inside my composable? 
To call suspend functions safely from inside a composable, use the launch defect API, which triggers a coroutine scoped side effect in Compose. OK, so I can wrap my delay call in a launch defect, like so, which um, launches a coroutine with a block of code passes a parameter, and the coroutine will be cancelled if launch defect lo leaves the composition for any reason. <laughs> launch defect ca takes keys as parameters that are used to restart the effect whenever one of those keys changes. What happens is that the ongoing coroutine is cancelled and a new coroutine is triggered with the new state values. OK, then I need a key. What if I use on timeout as my key? Uh, will that work? And then I can just call on timeout after the delay uh, to trigger whatever happens after the data is loaded. Sure, that would work. In this case, if on timeout gets a new value, for example, when the parent composable changes how the lambda should behave, then the effect would restart. However, for this particular use case, it doesn't make that much sense, right? We wouldn't want to restart the effect when the lambda changes because that will restart the delay and it will take longer. Ideally, we would like the effect to keep running even if the lambda changes. OK, I can fix this by changing the key. To trigger the side effect only once during the life cycle of this composable, we can use a constant as a key. For example, launch defect of unit. Yeah, with the constant, the effect will be triggered just once when this composable enters the composition. However, I think we still have some issues to fix. If on timeout changes while the side effect is in progress, there is no guarantee that the new on timeout is called when the effect finishes. We want the launch defect to invoke the delay only once during the lifecycle of this composable function, and also ensure that we invoke the latest on timeout lambda value. We can guarantee this by remembering on timeout using the remember updated state ABI, so we will capture and update the newest value. So here we define current on timeout with remember updated state, which wraps the on timeout lambda. And now we call current on timeout instead of on timeout directly. Exactly. Remember updated state is actually a very important API. It should be used when parameters or values computed during composition are referenced by a long-lived lambda or object expression, which might be common when working with side effects. So as a general rule of thumb, when using lambdas in a side effect, always think if you should be using remember update state. Most of the time, the answer might be yes. If you want to restart the effect when the lambda changes, then don't use this API and add the lambda as a key to the effect. Great. So our landing screen is completed. It loads data in the background. And after it's done, it calls the current on timeout, which calls the on timeout lambda. So now our second step is to actually call the landing screen somewhere to display it when the app is open. So if we go to our main activity, we find the main screen, which is the first screen that we show in the, in the app, the first composable. And it will call Crane Home, which contains search parameters and the list of suggested destinations. So instead of just calling Crane Home directly, we can define a variable show loading screen, which is a variable that will determine whether to show or hide the, lo the loading screen. And then we can write an if statement. So if show landing screen is true, we show the landing screen. Else we just go to Crane Home. Now landing screen receives a on timeout lambda parameter, which is called after the delay. So we want to change lo show landing screen to be false, which will make the composable recompose. And when the function recomposes, show landing screen is false, then we navigate to crane home. We run it very fast, but we can run it again to see that if we run the app, we show the landing screen for two seconds, and then we navigate straight into our crane home. Cool, nice. That's a pretty nice splash screen. We've implemented it like this for learning purposes. But again, if you want to add a proper splash screen to your app, consider the splash screen API that was added in Android 12. It also provides a compact library that supports older versions. Link in the description. OK, we learned a lot of things in this section of the code lab. What a side effect is, and how to use launch effect and remember updated state. What's next? In this next step, we'll make the navigation drawer work. Currently, nothing happens when you try to tap the drawer icon. So we'll open the crane home file, and we go to 
Crane Home content here. There is an open drawer event that we need to complete, and we have a scaffold state defined with a remember scaffold state, remember function. Scaffold state has a drawer state with methods to open or close the navigation drawer programmatically. So we can just call scaffold state.drawer.open to open the navigation drawer. And that should be that. However, we see an error. And that's because open is a suspend function. And we get an error the same as we did before. We need to run this in a coroutine. Actually, some Compose APIs are suspend functions. Suspend functions help represent concepts as they happen over time. And this is the case of opening the navigation row. Open suspends the execution of the coroutine where it's been called until it finishes. Then the coroutine resumes execution. A suspend function needs to be called from a coroutine, but the open draw function is just a simple regular function. And here we cannot use launch defect because we are not in a composable context. Right, so I cannot use launch defect like before to run my suspend function because we get a different error, and which is launch defect can only be run in composition. Yeah, so how can we create a new coroutine here? So ideally, we want the coroutine scope that follows the lifecycle of the call site. And we can use the remember coroutine scope API to create a coroutine scope. With this scope, you can start coroutines when you're not in composition, like for example here. You just call launch and run our scaffold state door state open. We just run the app. Um, in, in, in the open drawer callback, we just call this uh, function and that's it. The scope will be automatically canceled when this composable leaves the composition. And if we run the app now, we see that the navigation drawer works and our drawer works. Cool, nice, thank you. The last part of this section of the code lab explains the difference between launch defect and remember coroutine scope. Make sure to check it out. Let's move on to the next section of the code lab. We'll see how to create a new state holder. In our app, if you tap on choose destination, you can edit the field and filter cities based on your search input. The text weight also changes from regular to bold. There is a fair bit of logic and state there. Let's take a look and see how we can improve this code. Great, so the composable for choose destination is editable user input. The crane editable user input composable takes some parameters like hint and caption, and caption corresponds to the optional text next to the icon uh, when, where you type your destination. In our case, is this two string besides Spain. This implementation has some downsides. We can make it better. For example, the value of the text field is not hoisted and therefore cannot be controlled from outside. But also, the logic of this composable could become more complex and the internal state could be out of sync. Something we can do to alleviate this is create a state holder responsible for the internal state of this composable so that you can centralize all state changes in one place. Definitely, let's do that. Let's create a plain state holder class named editable user input in the same file. And let's see a little bit what we have now. So this class has a text which is a mutable state of type string. Uh, we define it as mutable state because compose tracks changes to the values and recomposes when changes happen. And we expose also an update text method to modify the text instead of making the text setter public. So now this class is a single source of truth to modify the text. The class also takes an initial text which is just a dependency that is used to initialize our text. And the logic to know if the text is a hint or not is, is in the isHint method here, which performs the check on demand. Now, if these logics get more complex in the future, we only need to make changes to this one class, editable user input state. This will simplify things for our future self. I think it's a good practice to follow. Compose offers this type of classes for their own composables as well. You might have already encountered the scaffold state and lazy list state state holders. And actually, a typical compose pattern we can do now is providing a function to remember the state, like remember scaffold state or remember lazy list state. In this way, you can create state more easily and keep the same instance in the composition instead of creating a new one every time. For our case, we could call this function remember editable user input state. 
Sure, let's implement that in this very same file. Remember, editable user input state. So we define remember editable user input state function that will remember an instance of editable user input state. It also takes hints as a key. So if the hint changes and there is a recomposition, this class instance will be recreated with the newest value. Um, and now, if we only remember this state, it won't survive activity recreations. So we can use remember saveable instead, which behaves similar to remember, but now the stored value will also survive activity and process recreation. Remember saveable uses the saved instance state mechanism under the hood, which stores information inside a bundle. The bundle can store primitive types without any further instructions. But our state here is a little bit more complicated. Exactly. We need to tell Remember Savable how to save and restore an instance of this class using a saver. Hmm. In our case, for the saver of the editable user input state class, we can use some existing Compose APIs such as list saver or map saver to reduce the amount of code that we need to write. These functions store the values to save in a list or a map, respectively. So it's a good practice to place the saver definitions close to the class they work with because they need to be statically accessed. So let's implement it. We first define a companion object in editable user input plain class. Then we can write a saver. A saver describes how an object can be converted into something that is savable. Implementations of a saver need to override two functions, save and restore. In this case, we use a list saver as the implementation detail of uh, the saver to store and restore an instance of editable user input state. In the save function, we are storing all of the class parameters as a list. And in the restore, you can retrieve them by the position that they occupy on this list. We have our saver completed. Now we can go to remember editable user input state where we can use our new saver. So we go and we write our saver as editable user input state of saver. And now remember, saveable knows how to store and restore an instance of our class. Uh, keep in mind, because remember, saveable stores state in a bundle which has limited size, you just store the minimum state required, like very simple objects, IDs or keys, and avoid storing heavy objects or list of objects. To know more, see the saving UI state documentations in the link below. Nice. Let's see how this looks like from the color side. Instead of having the state and the logic in the composable function itself, we need to delegate that complexity to the state holder. And to make this function more reusable across the app and in tests and previews, we should allow hoisting. Yep, let's do that. We'll use editable user input state instead of text and is hint. First, we're going to replace hint with our state. And we can give it a default value so that we don't always have to pass state in simpler cases, um, which is a best practice. And for this, we can use our remember it, our user input state that we defined before with an empty hint. We can also remove the on input state or on input changed lambda event because all of the state is hoisted now. So if colors need to know if the input changed, they can't define the state. They can hoist, define the state, and pass it into this function. And next, we can remove the internal state. We're not going to need it, because now we have our state implemented like so. And now it's a matter of just, uh, obviously, our uh, function does not, doesn't compile. Just make the tweaks necessary to use our state instead of the internal state that we had before. So now uh, uh, we write state dot is hint like so everywhere that we need. We are not going to need this it's hint call, it's hint like, like here. In the value of the basic text field, we call state.rText. And every time there is a on value change, we call state our method state.updateText with the latest value to update the text. Um, and since we changed the API, we need to check in all the places where it's called to make sure we're passing the appropriate parameters. And if we go and find the usages of this, we're going to see that the only place that calls this, uh, this composable is to destination user input, which we need to fix. But first, let's quickly see where we are in our composable structure. Search content has three tabs, 
flight, sleep, and eat. Right now, we're in the flight tab of flight search content. And all the selectors to change things like people or destinations are here. And to destination user input is just a wrapper around crane editable user input. So now we are in to destination user input composable, you should see a build error. We need to fix the parameters because we no longer have a hint or on input changed. So let's start by remover, removing on input change like so. And for hints, in order to define a state with an initial value different than the default, we can define the state here with remember editable user input state and pass the same hint it originally had. We replace hint parameter with state, we're calling it state now, and passing editable user input state. And that's it, that's our composable compiling now. Cool, nice, and thanks for showing the diagram. It's much easier to see like that. In to destination user input, there is some functionality missing. We need to notify callers when the input changes so that they can react to it and apply logic when that happens. Due to how the app is structured, we don't want to hoist the editable user input state any higher up in the hierarchy because we don't want to couple other composables like flash search content with it. How can we call the onto destination changed lambda from here and still keep this composable reusable? So we can trigger a side effect every time the input changes and call the onto destination changed lambda that we're not using yet. So let's define a current on destination changed variable and use remember updated state to wrap the uh, on to destination changed lambda in turn. And this is exactly what we did before because we are going to use this inside a launch defect. Then we will create a launch defect and using editable user input state as key. And don't worry too much about this now. We're going to explain it later. And the next code right now, what we are doing is right here, observing uh, it whenever we have new changes in our text, filtering out whenever it's a hint, because we're not interested on that, and collecting every new event where there is a new text and calling current on destination change with the new text. Oh, and there is actually a new API that you are using there, right? Snapshot flow converts composed state objects into a flow. When the state read inside snapshot flow mutates, the flow will emit the new value to the collector. In our case, we want to convert the state into a flow to use the power of flow operators. With that, we filter when the text is not a hint and collect the emitted items to notify the parent that the current destination changed. Exactly. Now, now that the code is complete, let me explain some of the decisions that we made. So first, because we're using a lambda inside of the launch defect, we use the remember updated state API to guarantee that the latest value passed to on destination changed is used. And then we're passing editable user input state as the key to the launch defect because we want the effect to restart if the to destination user input composable is recomposed with a new state instance. If we don't do this, even if the function recomposes, this launch defect might keep running using an incorrect version of the latest state. And apart from seeing an incorrect behavior in our app, you might also be leaking all state in memory. Mm -hmm. From what you explained and what we've seen so far, I think there are two rules of thumb we can pretty much follow all the time. We already explained the first one, and it's that if you are using a lambda inside a side effect, consider wrapping it inside a remember update state. The second one is about keys to use with effects. Almost every instance used inside a side effect should be considered a key, unless you know that the instance is very unlikely to change. In our launch defect, we are using the state instance to perform operations. That's why we are adding it as key. Exactly. And there are no visual changes in this step of the code lab, but we've added a state holder to a UI element to make it more robust, encapsulating state and UI logic to improve its reusability. If we run the app now, we should see that everything is working like it did before. In this section, we'll improve how the detail screen starts. Whenever we go and click on a city, we show the detail screen. And this is where we'll be working. So we go to details activity, and find the detail screen. 
which represents the whole screen. And we see that we get the city details by calling viewmodel.cityDetails, which has the city name, country, description, and image URL. And then if the result is successful, we just show that composable details content, else we show an error. Now imagine if city details takes longer to load because it requires a lot of complex data. You don't want your users staring at a blank screen for too long. In this case, what we could do is add a loading screen to show while data is loading and when the data is ready, display the details content. Let's see how we can build that. One way to model the state of the screen is with a data class that exposes multiple but related pieces of state, data to display on the screen and then loading and error signals. So this class details UI state can have the information we need. Uh, we have CD details like name the, and coordinates of the city is loading to represent if the screen is loading or if we get an error, we have a Boolean throw error. Then in the details view model, we could define a new pair of variables, like so. And your state is a state flow. Just like we had before, we expose a public version of a, of a variable with a private backing variable as well. And this flow can be updated inside the details view model when the information is ready or fails. And then in the UI, Compose can collect from this stream with collect a state with lifecycle API that you already know about. But let's do something different this time. Yeah. For the sake of this exercise and learning a new API, we are going to implement an alternative to the UI state production solution we saw in the first steps. Instead of producing the screen UI state in the view model, now we are going to do it in Compose code using the produce state API. Produce state allows you to convert non-composed state you can get from other layers of the hierarchy into composed state so that composables can recompose when that state changes. I think it's interesting to see how this API works because this other stream wrappers like collect a state with lifecycle use it under the hood. So let's rewrite this code entirely. So first, let me clear this part of the code and let's define the U our UI state with the produce state to emit UI state updates. So this API receives an initial value and for this we can send details UI state with the is loading value of true. So the first thing the user will see when opening the screen is the loading screen. And then we have a Lambda producer call. So the first thing that we can do is, just like we had before, have a call to viewmodel.cd details. And then we can assign our value variable so if CD details result is successful, we show we, we emit details UI state with the result of loading that data, else we emit details UI state with a true value for throw error because there's been an error. Cool. Produce state launches a coding scope to the composition that can push values into the return state using the value property that you consider. Because we are in a coroutine context, we can do asynchronous calls from here and update our state. So finally, let's add a when statement where we map different values of the details UI state to composables. Depending on the UI state, if UI state.cd details is not null, we'll show the details. If the value is loading, we'll show a circular progress indicator, which is our loading spinner, else we show the error composable. Now, if we run the app now, you won't see probably the loading screen because for now, loading is too quick for us to see any progress bar. But if the call was doing something more interesting, like fetching data from the network, you would see it spin um, as, it as it would take a little bit more to load. So just to test it, what we can do is just add a fake delay to our producer call. And we can run the app in the meantime to imitate what would happen if this call took longer. Uh, and we can add the delay directly to the producer call, as Man was saying before, because produce state launches a coroutine scoped to the composition. And now if we go and open any city, we see the spinner and then we navigate to the detail screen. Cool, nice. Our recommendation is to produce the screen UI state in a view model class that can access the data layer. But if your UI state is very simple and doesn't need to communicate with other layers of the app, 
Purdue State is the best Compose alternative. You can learn more about this in the UI State Production Architecture documentation. Brill, I think we're ready to move on to our last and final API. The last improvement we're going to make to Crane is showing a button to scroll to top in the list of suggested destinations. We'll show this button when you scroll the list and you pass the first element on the screen. Tapping the button takes you to the first element on the list. So let's open Explore section and let's see the Explore section composable, which contains what we see in the bottom sheet, like the section title, lazy column, and different events. So to calculate whether the user has passed the first item, we can define a show button variable. We use lazy columns, lazy list state, and check if first visible um, item index is larger than zero. And this is an AB implementation that gets the information that we need. The rest of the code should be familiar. The first thing we want to do is wrap this code, a bit of refactor here, wrap this code in a box so our button shows on top of the explore section as we scroll. And then we add a simple if statement. So if show button is true, we are going to show the floating action button, else we uh, hide it. Now, in order to scroll to um, an item, we need to implement the on click of our float floating action button. And, and to do this, we can just call lazily state now that we have it dot scroll to item. But again, this is a suspend function, so we need a coroutine scope. And we already uh, know how to solve this. We can define a coroutine scope and use this coroutine scope to launch a coroutine. And we use it to run our suspend function like so. And that's pretty much all of the code done. Now, if we run the app, we go to a list of suggested destinations. And when we scroll, we should see our button shows up whenever we scroll past the first item. We tap on the button, we go to the top of the list. That button is actually very handy. The implementation works, but I think we can make it more efficient. Right now, the composable scope reading show button recomposes as often as first visible item index, which happens frequently when scrolling. Yeah, and also notice that Android Studio complains as well. Uh, there is an error saying that frequently changing state should not be directly read in a composable function. Mm -hmm, exactly. Instead, we want the composable scope to recompose only when the condition toggles between true and false or vice versa. There is an API that allows us to do this, the derived state of API. The derived state of is used when you want compose state that's derived from another state. The derived state of calculation block is executed every time the internal state changes. But the composable function will recompose only when the result of the calculation changes. This minimizes the amount of time functions reading show button recomposes. Mm -hmm. List state is composed state, and our calculation also needs to be composed state because we want the UI to recompose when its value changes to show or hide the button. Using the drive state of API in this case is a better, more efficient alternative. But Android Studio is still giving us a warning. And it's saying, creating a state object during composition without using remember. So we still have one last change to make, and this is using remember together with derived state of. So, so the calculated value survives recomposition, and this is very similar to what we do when we use mutable state together with remember. Now we're all done, our code works, and it's super efficient. And make sure you check out the When Should I Use Derived State of blog post, linked in the video description to learn more about one of my favorite APIs. So you did it. You've completed the advanced state and side effects in Jetpack Compose workshop. Well done. Today, you learned complex concepts about how to produce UI state and how to consume it from the UI. You also learned what side effects are at the different APIs that you can use. A lot of APIs. Let's do a quick recap. Use launched effect to call suspend functions safely in the composition. Remember update the state to guarantee the usage of the latest lambda value passed as a parameter in a side effect. And remember coding scope to launch coding scope to the composition outside the scope of a composable function. Produce state to produce compose data asynchronously in the composition 
and derive state of to derive compose state from another state efficiently. And two more takeaways to remember before we leave. If you're using a lambda inside the side effect, consider wrapping it inside the remember updated state API to guarantee the latest pass value is always used. And if you are using objects inside a side effect, consider having them as keys to restart the side effect whenever one of those objects changes. Strong emphasis in consider. Stop for a second and think about it. Think if you want to restart the effect or not. It might be the case or it might not. Hashtag, it depends. After you're done with the code lab, you can check out the code in the end branch to compare your solutions and see if you missed anything. Also, we recommend taking a look at now in Android, our sample app that showcases multiple of the best practices we saw here today. All the important links of APIs, documentations, and blocks are attached in the video description. Thanks for watching this workshop, and please let us know in the comments if you found the guide useful, and also what you would like to know more about. Thanks, and have a good one. Bye.